Yishem Adonai Baruch Matav Adolam. String therapy, this is our topic today. And the question is, yes, no. <coughs> what the Torah has to say about it, what the Rambam has to say about that. Um, <coughs> we've learned last time that everyone is different. The Talmud says in Masechet Brachot, Daf Nun Chet says, Keshem Sheper Tzufehem Shonim, Kach Deotehem Shonot. Same as their faces are different, people's faces are different, their opinions also are different. What's the meaning of it? I'll, don't expect to be like someone else. Don't expect, don't try to be what, like someone else. Everyone has his own journey. As when everyone has his own uh, uh, midot, characteristics, uh, trait, right, to, to, to rectify. Um, obviously, we need to learn from the Chachamim, from the sages, but everyone has his own tikkun, his own neshama, his own inyanim, his own thing. It was like, uh, I, I brought this as an example last time in the Shi'ul, another place, you know, uh, people sitting in a test. And the tester is looking and watching, and see one guy is looking and picking to his neighbor. Says, everybody, please focus on your test. Then he's talking to him directly. Focus on your test. And he's keep looking and looking. Says, I asked you before, focus on your test. A few times, he's not listening. He's keep looking, you know, uh, to... Uh, get the information or the, use the same choices that the neighbor did on his test. When the tester collected all the tests and the guy came to him, he took the test from him and he said, just wanted to tell you that all the tests here are different. Ah. <laughs> you were copying from, uh, I was picking to the wrong test. Uh, we can learn from that to our own life. You can look at these people, family, woman, man, doesn't matter, and said, I want to be like that, and I'm going to learn the way he did. Now, of course, you want to learn from the Chachami, from the sages, from the rabbis, but even, even if you didn't reach that point, don't try to compare yourself to him. Everyone has his own journey. The starting point is different for each person. Some people born to a firm family, some to a secular. They have to go through a different journey. Some neshamot can be found else, you know, in, in, in South America, in Japan, in China, in America, in Europe. They're Jewish, and they have to do their way to the uh, Ariza. Please put yourself on uh, mute. Shmuel, Sam, Ariza, put yourself on mute. Oh my goodness. I don't know how to do that. Mute everybody. <laughs> I can't. I don't have control. Sam, put yourself on mute, please. I can hear you. Well, do you have like an animal there? Oh, he's talking and it sounds buffling. Okay. So, anyways, there's a reason why we're here. And now, if this family, with this wife, with this husband, at these children and so forth and so on. Even if people that have a challengers, a challenging kids, there is a reason for everything. That would be people have kids that are sick. A call, everything comes in the hashbon, in calculation in front of Hashem. There is a reason why people get, when I say something very, very delicate, uh, certain kids, some of them challenging, some of them not, some of them even sick, some of them disabled. There is a reason for everything. And, but you keep hearing this complaint from people, well, Hashem did it to me. What did I do wrong? You might look in this life. You see, nothing is wrong in this life. Maybe, maybe if you look at the big picture, not even to the details, you see that, why well, Hashem is doing that to me? And there's a pasuk in, in, in the book of Devarim, Deuteronomy 32, says the following. And this is the key, the answer for all these questions. The pasuk says, Hatsur tamim po'alo, kichol derachav mishpat, el emuna ve'en avel tzadik v'yashar hu. God's deeds are perfect, for all his ways uh, are just, 
a faithful God without injustice. He is righteous and upright. Means Hashem is calculating everything before He sends Neshama to this world. God forbid someone is sick, they, they, all of a sudden parents get, you know, the wife gets pregnant, Bo Hashem, and they got a baby with some uh, defects. But the child is sick. And they ask him, what did I do wrong? Maybe it's not because you did something wrong. Maybe because you're on the Shamot, <coughs> so special, so great. You can help such a child. Or maybe you're in the Shamot, we're here in the world, in the first Gilgul. All these three Neshamot, the father, the son, the son and, the, and, and the mother. You know, when a judge is judging, he can maybe look at the person in front of him, maybe he'll take under consideration the wife, the children, the close, the close circle. But the Kodesh Bochu, when Hashem is judging someone, he's taking under consideration everything. The small close circle and the bigger circle. It could be the wife, now she's going to be, God forbid, a widow, the kid's going to be orphaned. And all those who get probably from that are going to suffer from it. Parents, friends, work, debts. If you die, who will pay his debts? He took loans or whatever. So Hashem takes all these under consideration. What what's a human being, flesh and blood, judge, cannot calculate. You know, there's a pasuk, ve'ele ha'mishpatim asher tasim lifnehem. You familiar with this parasha mishpatim? Hmm? It says in the Zohar, da raza de gilgula. The Torah speaks about mishpatim that we need to keep. And the Zohar says, this is the secret of the gilgulim. So once the Magid bin Mezrich approached the Baal Shem Tov and he asked him, please explain to me this Pasuk. Baal Shem Tov said to him, you know what? He asked him, he directed him to go to a forest, to a certain place, and he says, when you reach a big tree by uh, uh, the river, camp, in a place that you can watch this big tree. You won't miss it. It's really a big tree by this river. Okay, so he went there, the Magid. He was hiding behind some bushes, preparing himself. The Book of Tehillim is reading quietly and he's observing. All of a sudden they see a horse rider is coming, stopping by the, this tree. Coming down, he has a, a big bag of money. Put it aside, put his clothes. He ate something, he went to swim in the river, clean up himself, going back, dressing up, going on a horse, leaving. He forgot one thing. What did he forget? The money. Forgot the money. Minutes later, a poor guy is coming, looks like poor sitting down, wants to eat, and all of a sudden you see a bag. He opens the bag, you see a lot of money. He looks around, there's no one, no one there. He's all himself, by himself, in the big forest, by the river. Quickly he finishes what he, what he did there, he took the money and he left. A few minutes later, another, come, another guy came. Look even worse than the second one. He's opening a small box, taking a cloth, putting on it some dry uh, bread, and he starts to eat. All of a sudden, they hear. <laughs> the horseman is coming back. He's coming back for what? Money. That's money. Then he stopped there. You see a guy sitting there eating. He stopped the horse jumping out. He says, where's the money? This third guy says to him, well, what money? What are you talking about? Don't play a game with me. Where's the money? I just left uh, half an hour ago. Where's the money? Of course, the third guy doesn't know what he's talking about. So the horseman didn't let go and started to beat him up. He beat him up till to the point that he thought he's dead. 
And then he left. He had nothing to do. He searched all the place. He couldn't find it. So he left. The Magid Mizrich understand that this is the end of the story. So I went back to uh, the Balchemto. And he says, Rebbe, Rebbe, why you send me there? He said, tell me what you see, what you saw. So he explained to him. First, so the writer and second guy. The second guy came, he took his money. Third guy came. First man came, beat him up, he almost died. So I said, let me tell you, all these three people, this is the Mishpatim. Ele HaMishpatim. This is three people lived in life before. Many, a few years ago. Many years ago. The first guy, the horse rider, owed money to the second guy that came. He got a loan from him. And he denied it. So the second guy took him to court. The judge, the Dayan, was very slappy. He didn't care. He didn't really investigate. And he let the horseman, uh, the, the, right, uh, live without paying anything. So now, Kodesh Baruch he put them all together in the same place. And the money that the second guy found was the exact amount that he owed him the leg before. Mm. So I said, okay, who's the third guy? <coughs> he said, that was the judge. Oh, that was wow. the judge that messed up. That he, didn't, he lived now in poverty. He was a guy that used to take bribe. He used to, you know, to uh, um, have his um, business without really checking thoroughly and investigating as he should. And many people suffered. And now he lives in, in such a way. When we see the Pasuk, Ele Mishpatim, we don't even realize Hashem is so accurate. Hashem is a tzaddik. We see things and we judge by what we see. But who can blame us? Right? It says, "En lo la dayan, ella mashena vroot." I can judge only for, for for what I see. We see we see from here that Hashem is so great. How much plans and thinking that no human being, flesh and blood, can ever do. Bedikduk medugdak. Now we're going back to the text. This was just an introduction. And it's very important that uh, Ayala, I think you are Ayala at the uh, telephone. See me mute. Ayala, microphone shelach patuach. Okay, so now we're going to continue in the text. What we're doing now, Bez Hashem, is the introduction. And soon we're going to start to go to the main core. Today we'll learn something very special. You'll see from today, Torah class, from class, that it's very, very important that everybody should study Musar and focus on Musar. There is no way you can improve and rectify your Midot without learning Musar, without getting the, having the tools to fix your bad Midot. It takes time, but Be'ezrat Hashem will get there. So uh, what I want you to read is, actually this is extra, go to the text when we read about, uh, okay, 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 In this this part I'm not there yet and I'm gonna skip that part actually. Oh okay. Okay, I got it. Here. One. Okay. Yes, please. Yeah. One man is wrathful and always angry, and another even tempered and never angry. Or if he is, it is only very negligible over a period of many years. One man is exceedingly proud, another exceedingly humble. One man is lustful, his lust never being sated. Another exceedingly pure-hearted, not desiring even the few things that the body needs. Okay. It's, what was, it's connected to what we say in the very beginning. People are different. 
So how is this shi'ur, this class, is related to me? Uh, someone has a short fuse. Someone is uh, laid back. He take his time in thinking. Remember we talked about the four elements? The fire, the wind, the... Earth, air, fire, water. Water and? Earth. 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 <coughs> One that... Uh, he is, uh, uh, it comes from fire, let's say, he, the, the, the element of fire in him is stronger, it will be a uh, short fuse. Ruach, uh, wind, he will be uh, with pride, gaive. Um, earth will be lazy, the mida, the trait of laziness, will be very high in him. And water will have a lot of desire, it's called Baal Ta'avot. A lot of desires. He likes to try everything. He likes to test. He likes to uh, explore everything. He likes to try everything. Actually, this book, Baruch Hashem, is teaching us how to control and give us the tools first to find out what's wrong with us, and secondly, how to fix it. So, how we can change the midot? How we can rectify? How can we? F- how can we fix the midot? This is, this is the one million dollar question. Most of the people, they born and die without trying even to change anything in their life. It is what it is. This is me. You know me in before. We got married. You know me. We've been together for two, three years. This is me. First of all, we need to know that there is no magic solutions. It takes time hard work, and we need, it's a long way, and we need to practice it every day. This is why our sages are teaching us to study Musa every day, two, three minutes. It takes time to change person's uh, uh, ways. Mm -hmm. Change your habits. Mm -hmm. Change your habits. A lot of exercise. You need to investigate about yourself. You need to learn what is the sickness. People are sick. You need to understand that kas, according to Rambam, he says that when someone is mad, you're upset, or you have a temper, you should know it's a sickness. It's a problem. It needs to be fixed. And this is probably one of the reasons you're back in this world, in this Google, to fix that. And probably it's not going to happen in one day. All the tools that we have in this sefer, there is no other better than them. I'm telling you, it's guaranteed. People, when they learn this sefer, and it happens before we both Hashem, we studied in many groups many years ago, you start to learn not only about yourself, about your partners as well. And I had a guy that came to me and says, you know, Bizchut, thanks to this sefer, I have Shalom Bait. He says, I've noticed that I'm asking from my wife things that she's actually not able to. I start to recognize what it's called midot. What's midah of uh, laziness? The midah of being, uh, I don't know, quick, being uh, uh, whatever. Well, all the midot we have here. Okay, I'm not going to go through the whole list, but now I understand, I understand that at some point I'm asking too much. And it leads to a lot of uh, conflict. And we fought at home. I recognize things about myself, about my wife. Now I know what's the limit. Everyone born with different characteristics. Am I saying it right? Yes. Characteristics. 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 Character. Character. Okay. I'm going to say midot, okay? Forget okay, it. that's good. Midot. <laughs> With different right, midot. Or traits is another midot. What he's trying to say, to say here in the, in, in the introduction, and I'll try to summarize because it's really long, he says that Chacham, a smart man, is like a chef. A chef takes the food, and you know which spices to put and how much. What does that mean? If you put, you have to put salt. If you put too much salt, you're going to spoil the food. Too much black pepper, you're going to spoil it. Let me ask you a question. Generosity is good or bad? It's good. Usually good. Good with boundaries. Good with boundaries. 
Uh, pride, hardiness, good or bad? Huh? Pride, or what's called hardiness. Well, it it's good or bad? It, it depends. It's Anger, it's good or bad? Dep it depends on the situation. <laughs> The Jewish answer is always depend. You should learn that. <laughs> depend. Generosity is good, but with, as he says, with boundaries. Yeah, Otherwise, you're going to lose all your money. Spoil or spoil a child. You become poor if you start to give all what you have in, in your bank account. Or you give to spoil a child. Or spoil your child. So how pride can be good? Proud of your... If I need to use it, remember the, the, what he says in the book that a chacham is smart, the wise, he, like a chef, he needs to use some cinnamon, some salt, some, some spices. Sometimes we need to mix in our life pride, anger, you'd be surprised. Uh, 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 all the bad traits that we will learn, they are good and bad. The idea here is to learn how to control them where to bring them to the cooking and which way quantity dosage it's all important if pride is so bad how can i use it in my own life can you give me an example how can i use pride in my life if it's bad and i have to uh stay away from it last week we've learned it's the source of all evil there's no evil th greater than that but pride doesn't have to be happiness you can be proud of for example you can be proud of being a Jew. Of a student, of your student. Or you can be proud of being a Jew. You can be proud of your country. Okay, okay. So this is this proud is allowed. This is something that we can use in our own life, right? Let's let's move on with the text. One man is expansive of temperament, unsatisfied with all the wealth in the world, as it is written in Kohelis. He who loves silver will not be sated with silver, and another is of constricted spirit. Right. Someone he has uh, a lot of ta'avot, a lot of desires, and he's workaholic, and he's work over hours, and more, and more. he wants more money, and more gold, more. Doesn't have, he doesn't have enough already have. He doesn't have life, basically. So what's wrong with working? Not what he says wrong with working, but you have to be with boundaries. So when you learn about yourself that you probably come from water, and water means ta'avot, means desires, you will learn that this could be very bad for you. You don't know where to stop. You're losing, basically losing your family, your wife, everybody complains, they don't see you. The kids don't see you. You're traveling all day long. I know people that you barely see them on Shabbat. The whole week they travel. And when they come here, you see them in the shul on Shabbat, and uh, do kiddush and go to sleep. They don't see the kids. They grow up. To bring what? More money. Go ahead. Uh, another is of a constricted spirit, for whom even a trifle suffices, and he does not rush to obtain all of his needs. One man afflicts himself with hunger and goes begging, consuming not even a penny's worth of his own without dire distress. And another is wantonly extravagant with his money. And along the same lines, the other traits are found, such as cheerfulness and depression, stinginess and generosity. Right. All what we said above. Okay, the next part, we'll continue. Cruelty and mercy, cowardliness and courage, and the like. Among these traits, there are those possessed by a man from the beginning of his creation, according to his bodily nature, and there are those towards which one's nature is inclined and which he is apt to adopt more than others. And there, are the, and there are those traits which one does not possess from birth, but which he learns from others. Okay. This one. You know, people have tendency toward many things. One, for example, have tendency to lie. And you give all the excuses that to lie is this world. It's, it's, it's not only permitted, it's a must. Otherwise, people will think you're a fool. Sucker. Sucker is a Yiddish word I, know, I just learned. Right? No. Yeah, it comes from Yiddish. Sucker. It's, it's, it's a fool. You, in Hebrew, you call it a friar. 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 
You have to. You, you can't manage. You can't find your way among people without lying. It's a must. Otherwise, everybody take advantage of you. So you find all this justification why it's kosher to lie. But in truth, what, I'm sorry? Manipulation. Manipulation. So in truth, we know that Hashem implemented in nature that emet, truth, will always win. Right now, you gain some profit with lying, stealing, cheating. At the, the, the end of the road, you will lose. Because this is how Hashem created the world, with emet. The truth is always, it's stable. You know, I'm not going to go through the whole, we studied many times, the, the, the word, in, it, it says that sheker has no legs. Lies has no legs. So people wonder, what does that mean, legs? The emet, the truth, has legs? Mm -hmm. What does that mean? The letters. Okay. If you look in Sefer Torah, you see the sheen like that. The emet, two, the letters are stable. The Aleph, two legs, the Mem, two legs, and, and the Tef, two legs. It's stable. But the Sheker is, is very close to people. Emet is far. If you see also the letters, Aleph in the beginning, Mem in the middle, Tef at the very end. Sheker, Kuf, Reshin, the letters are close to each other. People, tendency is too light to get off the hook. Rather than choosing the truth. A guy came to uh, be um, Shimon ben Shatach. He says, Rabbi, I want to do Teshuvah. He was a thief, well-known thief. Anytime it was a uh, break-in in one house, it was taken to investigation in, 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 the, in the police station. One day he says, Rabbi Shimon, I need to, they said to do Teshuvah. Give me, give me something, give me a tip. And Rabbi hug him and says, Baruch Hashem, you did the right thing. I'm going to give you one thing to do. He says, okay, Rabbi, I'll handle it. What is it? He says, just stick to the truth. From this point on, just tell the truth. I've been thinking, meaning that I can still, I can, I can uh, still uh, break in houses. And still. Just going to do the, uh, what the Rabbi told me, to tell the truth. And I'm going to have Gan Eden. Kol Tov, that's good. The very next night, he broke into a house, broke into a house. He took all what he could take. He was really expert. On the way out, he says, hold on one second. They're going to call me for investigation. And they ask me if I did that, I have to tell the truth. We shook hands, and I swore to the Rebbe. I'm going to tell the truth. I took upon myself the truth. He left the sack, and he left out. This next day, same thing happened to him, till they get to the point that the truth brought him back to do a full teshuvah. Just sticking to the truth. Sometimes you take upon yourself one thing to fix, and you fix many things in your life. You can't even imagine. One, stick to one. I always have people that think, Rabbi, what can I do to improve the health of the family, or to do this or do that? I don't have magic uh, solutions. I only know what a Torah teaches me. Stick to one thing. Start to put the feeling. Go to one Torah class a week. You know how many people we study one Torah class a week? One Torah class they committed and they become full Baal Tshuva. Keeping Shabbat. I'm talking facts, not uh, imagination. If you put too much weight on someone that can't carry it, you're going to break. Little by little, step by step. Same here with the Midot. You want to fix, you want to rectify, you start small. First to recognize what's the problem. And then we start to fix it. It says that, I'm going to skip to the to David Tavin. Uh, the, 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 the example with all the cooking we already uh, described. Here. No one understand. <clears throat> no one understand that one who by nature inclines to an evil trade or has become habituated to such a trade and does not take it upon himself to forsake it, but constantly strengthens himself in it, such a one will come to despise and abhor uh -huh. the corresponding positive trait. How is it possible? He's corrupted, and he despises those who have good midot, or even to change to a good midah. It, it doesn't make sense. You know the good is there, you're bad, 
and you despise the, the good, go ahead. And just as pain, distress, and afflictions indicate bodily illness, so evil traits indicate sickness of the soul. And just as to men who are physically ill, bitter tastes sweet, and sweet bitter, mm -hmm. and there are those sick men who desire food that is not good for them and hate good food that is good for them, all in accordance with the magnitude of the illness, so men who are sick of soul desire love, so men who are sick of soul desire and love evil traits, hate the way of good, and are loath to walk right. their own. And it's, 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 too, it's too heavy for them. The, the, you know how many people, unfortunately, finding justification in halacha to hurt other people? It's the halacha. This is how you should treat a, a rasha, a wicked man. So first they define this guy as a rasha. Huh? Not everything is mutar now. Everything is permitted to do to this guy. Great rabbi can insult other great rabbis or other leaders. With halacha, they, they, they have Shulchan uh, Aruch with them. There is the big question here is, as we have in the title of the Shio. Okay, one is sick. If someone is sick, where do you go? You go to the doctor to get medication. The body can get sick, but also the neshama can get sick. The nefesh can get sick. Midot raot. Bad traits, it means the nefesh, the neshama is sick. And the question is, should we go to a shrink slash psychologist slash a therapist? The answer is, no, absolutely yes. The halacha says it's a must. Go to the expert that can help you. Some people, you can't even communicate before even giving them a pill. I have an experience with uh, more than one guy. You can talk to them. They're all over. They must take medication. No, medication is against Torah. No, it's not against Torah. Go to the expert. They give the right medication so you can start to communicate. Uh, you see these cases every day. Uh, Ariel. You know, when I did research, who was the first person in Torah to say to go to talk to a person about your problems? No. Okay. It says, I have it written because I did a lot of research. Okay. Da'aga belev esh, da'aga belev ish yashichenna. Be'od makom, shakatuf alecha nasuach im... As the Rambam says that, and also other uh, uh, rabbis, it says it clear in the Torah, if someone has... Uh, and that you have worries, you have troubles, go speak with someone. First of all, the Pasuk says, Yashichenna. Yashichenna means put it down. We've learned in, the, in Shabbat, if someone has an anxiety, due to things that you do in the regular days, either the nails, the, you remember we talked that about it on Shabbat. One solution is to move from one spot to another. Another solution is to say, Shema Israel. It's very, very powerful. It gives strength to the Neshama. When you stop and you say, Shema Yisrael, Hashem Elokeinu, Hashem Echad. You to say it five times, say it five times. You'll see, you'll feel better. Let's, let's read the Keitzah. Let me, let me skip to this part. Mm, oh, the Keitzah. Who? Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who take darkness for light and light for darkness, who take bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. About them, it is said in Mishle, who forsake the paths of uprightness to walk in ways of darkness. Now, how can the healing of soul sickness be achieved? Let them go to the wise, the healers of souls. People, people are lazy because they say, everybody knows me that I'm so and so. I don't have to make effort. They like me the, the way I am. Can you tell me, give me a tip, how one can tell if he need to fix anything in his life? Okay, I came here to the shiu. I heard. Now I know, I want to know, do, is there anything I need to fix? Because I look at the mirror, I don't see too many things to fix. 
Maybe I'm wrong. What should I do? <laughs> Can you give me a tip? Ariella, chashavt on mashu? No, we, we, we learned that nobody is perfect. If we are here, we are here for a reason, correct? Good. So, I, how do I know? I, I look at the mirror and says, uh, this, is, this is perfect. I, I don't see anything wrong. How can I find what's wrong with me? And there's anything to fix. Are you asking? Yeah, I'm asking everybody. Everybody has to mirror it to you. Hmm? Somebody has to mirror it to you. Who? Who? You're saying right. Who? Who? A friend, rabbi, your wife, husband, the people that are close to you, they can tell you best what's wrong with you. But go to speak with someone. This is one of the ways. Speak with someone. Well, you know he's serious. You don't want to make fun of the whole situation. Ask him, what do you think is wrong with me? How can I fix? I tell you, for example, from the world of racquetball. Rabbi, your son and I, Adam, play racquetball. So... After going out of the court, I asked the guy, I would ask, so what do you think I did wrong? He says, well, eh, you're playing pretty good, you're okay. No, no, tell me, tell me, what are you doing? So he, he told me, he found a few spots, few things to tell me to improve. Without asking him, I would never know. That's the job of a coach, of a rabbi, of a teacher, to tell you what you did wrong. Could be a rebuke, could be an advice. If you be shy, you will never learn. And habayishan lamed. Shy student will never learn, he will never rectify, will never fix. Ask other people, tell me, what is wrong with me? Uh, I'm saying it, you know, maybe, not, I'm not picking up the right uh, terminology, but, I mean, there's anything you think I, can, I should do better in my life? You can go through the whole list of uh, midot that we have here. Am I an angry person? Do I have short, for few, short fuse? Do I have temper? Do you have simcha? I don't have much simcha. Tell me what you think. It's very important to shop around, ask all around. You'll be surprised, believe what people will tell you. Sometimes you won't like what you hear. But this is a must. You have to do that. We need to open our eyes. Everyone is his responsibility to check, explore, what needs to be fixed in his life. This is why Hashem is asking for yira. Fear. We have to mix fear, yirat shamayim, with every, every midah that we have. The only thing that can control the midot is yirat shamayim. Is yirat shamayim is like a pearl uh, necklace. It's like, it's the string. If you don't have the string, all gonna break. The pearls are the midot. That's the one that's holding it. The Yira, the Yira Shemaim, fear of Hashem, is like, it's like the, the police officer. It's like the, the microscope. that You can see what's uh, deep inside. It's like the fence. It's like the, the inspector. Yira, yira Shemaim is, is the knot that, that holds all the Midot together. Without it, everything will collapse. This is why we, the Hakdama, the introduction, focus on Yira Shemaim, fear of Hashem. The fool has the ability to turn good midot to bad. The wise man turn bad midot to good. He will take gava, hardiness, and use it in the right way. Use the spices very accurately. Let me just conclude with saying the following. You know, sometimes we talked about, um, no, we talked about uh, midot. We talked about uh, stubborn people. You have to change your midot, to let go, and so forth and so on. Sometimes to lose is to win. What does that mean? How losing can be winning. So, there is a story. I don't want to mention the name of the guy that wrote the book. The story is okay, but the guy that it was is another issue. A real story. A grandmother came to visit her family on Passover, looking at all the grandchildren in Benebrak. And she noticed that one of the grandchildren, girl, she likes to win all the time. She argues. She won't let go. She always has to win. 
So she decided at some point to speak with her. And you know, kids like story. She said, let me tell you a story. She told her, you know, many, many years ago, when I was at your age, I lived in Poland, in the time of the war, Hitler and Mach Shemoy Zichro. Times become really, really bad, to the point that they closed the factory of our father, grandfather. And Nazis came to the factory, they were all there. And my father was taken before he asked them to say something to his uh, wife. And they let him, and he whispered uh, to her ears something. And then they took him, they never saw him after that. And the grand grandmother said, to her as a child, you know what uh, Abba told me? He said that we should take all the money, leave the house, and go to Anna. Who is Anna? Anna was the maid servant that was working for them for many years, and they treat her really, really well. They were become like really close. She is not Jewish, but he actually advised the family take all the money and hide at her house. So they went to her house immediately that day. She lived in the fifth floor. No elevators coming all the way up. She opened the door and she see them. She got scared. They never visited her. She let them in and they told her, this is the situation. I'm here with Miriam, my daughter. We have to stay here. Please accept us. Oh, I'm gonna get in trouble. You know, I love you, but the German will kill me. There's no prison. They will kill me. They, uh, she really, really uh, cried and she tried to convince her and she said, you know what? I'll let you stay here under one condition. What's the condition? I'm the fifth floor. If the Germans come, you take your stuff and you jump from the window to the third floor. There was a balcony and I'm not connected to you. Something happens, just jump to that balcony and hide there. And you have no choice, you agree. So grandma was talking with her granddaughter. Uh, okay, so they're hiding there in the, in the room. Of course, she got all the money first from the lady. That was very convincing, the amount of money she came with. She let them stay and she took care of them. She gave them food and were hiding in the room. A few weeks later, the Germans uh, came with trucks to a whole that neighborhood and start to walk from uh, house to house, building to building. In the meantime, all these two weeks, uh, three weeks or four weeks, I don't remember exactly, a few weeks, the, this uh, grandmother that's telling the story, she was a child, her name was Miriam, playing with Anna's daughter, they were the same age. And Miriam was really good, and she was winning all the time. And Anna's daughter, she got upset. At some point, her mother called her and says, Miriam, let her win. What do you mean? Let her win. So, let her feel, feel, let her feel good. We are guests in her house. So, here and there she let her win. And then the mother always told her, let, let her win, let her win, let her win, let her win. And Miriam is telling to her grandmother, you know how, how was, it was so difficult for me to let go. But every time she wins, Anna's daughter, she was screaming, yes, and hugging Miriam. And she was asking the very next day, let's do another game and more games. They become really good friends. She felt now, not down, but more like equal to Miriam. Okay, two little kids playing. Let her win. Germans came. Anna says, you got to leave. Take your stuff and jump. Said, you mean, I'm going to jump, I'm going to break our legs, I'm going to die. So this is the agreement. I'm not going to risk my family for you. I helped you till this point. Please, that's our agreement. At this point, when we were close to the window, Anna's daughters came. She stood and says, I want them to stay here. Miriam is my friend. I want her to stay here. Says, Anna says to her daughter, I let them go. It's very risky. If you don't, if you push them, 
to leave, I will scream. She said, no, 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 scream. I will scream. She opened her window and she screamed, Wah! She said, oh, come on in, come on in. She grabbed her hand, closed the window. And she said, we don't have any solution. So we have a solution. In the attic, Miriam and I built a small room for us. I'm going to let them hide there. Okay. So Anna had no choice. She was listening to her own children, to her own daughter. She let them climb to the attic. They were hiding there. Three or four hours later, the Germans left. Obviously, they came and they checked. There was nobody there. And then they hear, I beat Miriam, I beat Miriam. It was like a code between them. When they say, beat Miriam, it means that you can go down, something like that. The big lesson in this, and of course I'm shortening the whole details, is that sometimes to lose is to win. Even if your mida is, I'm a winner. You can't just let go. It's no sport. Sport is to win. This is me. Sometimes you have to let go. Let the people around you feel comfortable. You don't have to always to show that you're greater than other people. When you give up and you let go, it'll be worthwhile for you at some point. I remember that Rabbi Shach once says, and always in my mind, he says, I never lose, I never lose in my life when I let go. Shevitarti le'olam lo ifsaditi. Need to be many times in our life more lenient to let go. Sometimes the midah that we have to show them, to show off, this is me. It's actually lying. You want me to lose? But you need to look at the other person in front of you, uh, feel his feelings. And bottom line, midot, it's very hard to change, but it's possible. The only question is, which midah needs to be fixed, needs to be rectified? What we learned today, and I think we'll stop here today, is just introduction. Be'ezat Hashem, if we want to continue with the book, we're going to jump to the first gate, the gate of pride from next week. The gate of pride is uh, very important. There's a, there's, there's a very... Uh, important reason why it's the first gate. From all the gates, the midah of ga'ava, haughtiness and pride is the first. On Shabbat, I met a lady, and she asked me, what's your uh, class on Sunday at the Goldstein? It said about pride, about ga'ava. <laughs> I don't have gava. I'm, I'm quoting. I don't have. I don't have. Uh, you know. I told her, you know what? Just by saying that, you have gava. Is that the same as chutzpah? How can you say something like that? Who has no gava in him? So I don't know if she is. Well, I don't know. I don't think she is in the class now. She didn't show up to class. But anyways, everyone has yeah, more or less gava. Huh? What does that mean? The gate. What is the on the? Gate open up. Sha'ar. Sha'ar means gate. Translation? But, but I mean, why, why are they called gates? When you open that gate, what's on the other side? It's because it's a whole house full of rooms. Come into a lot of levels, of a lot of rooms, a lot of stairs to climb, to go down. It's a gate that you open, you go in, you learn, and you go out, you close it, now you fix this midah. I want to wish everybody, all those participants, Baruch Hashem, we have uh, a lot of people on uh, Zoom, over 10, 12 people, and all the people that participate today, and I hope more will join us, Be'ezah Hashem, next time. Uh, we will ask, Be'ezah Hashem, every class, what you want to change, what you want to subtract, what you want to, we can make it more interesting. I like to focus on things that we are actually seeing and practicing on a daily life. It's most important. We can divide, of course, this shiur to some musar and Jewish halacha. I know many ask for me to do a selective halachot, either for netilat yadayim or for Shabbat, because things that we practice every day. So we can always divide this shiur and we'll fit to Ashkenazi and Sephardi and Yamanite, all is good. I want to thank the, the Goldstein for opening the house. May Hashem give you much beracha, naslacha for all the efforts you're making. And thank you for all those who came. 
Uh, thanks to you, we have a shiur. Without you, we won't have a shiur at all. God bless you. Shalom, shalom. Erev tov. Tadarba.